All right, so this is Martini Smarts. You guys recognize him from the round pin. <clears throat> okay, we uh, went from that 40 foot round pin in here to this 50 footer. The rain kind of ran us out out there and they're, they're about ready to come in here anyway. Have a little bit more room to move around in and, uh, and sort of graduate up to, um, to just kind of straight ride and less groundwork. We're still going to refine groundwork, but, but there's going to be less groundwork and more just kind of riding. We're going to call this series of videos the fundamentals of the snaffle bit. Okay. Because this is where they really start getting good at, at, um, at riding around, you know, and kind of getting soft to your hands and stopping and turning around, all that sort of thing. And we just start building all that stuff in, into them. So Now I try to be as efficient as I possibly can with these colts. And I don't like to waste motion if I can avoid it. That's why I try to only teach what I think they're going to need later on. I like to do it in the round pin. They, they had about two full weeks in that 40 foot pin. And I'll probably give them two to three full weeks here in this pin. Um, so they'll have, you know, about a complete month in a round pin. Uh, and they can stay in here a lot longer than a month. That, you know, a month isn't the, you know, that's not the magic number and they'll, even after they, after we, you know, graduate them to a bigger pin, they'll still come in here and spend quite a bit of time in the round pin. Um, it's just a handy tool to use, but so just want to go over, you know, you see, I haven't really done all the groundwork and, and all that stuff that I've been doing with this colt when he was in that smaller pin before I saddle him. I'm just going to go ahead and saddle him like he's a broke horse. He's a little apprehensive about it. Okay. But over time, he's going to get used to it. The one thing that I want to do is make sure that I, I stick to the stick to the um, the safety principles that that I explained before about saddling. You still don't want to come back here and get behind his drive line and try to fling the pad up on there. Okay, stay up here in front of his drive line. Get the blanket on him. Now that is an essential bit of information right there. If you guys have watched me any time at all, you know that I really stress the value of understanding the concept of the drive line. A lot of times I call it the balance point. The reason is, is because that's how we control the forward motion in these young horses and in cattle. It's kind of like knowing that the, the gas is on the right and the brake is on the left in your car. Sure, you can get along without understanding that, but it's going to really change the experience and it's going to make things a heck of a lot less predictable. Okay, carry your saddle just like, just like you're headed off to school and these are your books. All right, just, just set it up there. Like I said, he's a little bit apprehensive about that stuff, but you can remember, if you'll remember a couple of weeks ago when I go to saddle this colt, I mean, he just, he really didn't appreciate it at all. And he really didn't like me coming around him behind him like this. Um, those early days that I saddled him in those pins out there, he dumped the saddle a couple of times because it kind of spooked him when I swapped eyes. But we just stay consistent, go slow, and eventually they get over all that stuff. Now, I've had some folks take issue with me over this topic recently. It seems the common opinion is that we ought to stay with these lessons and these young horses until they're 100% comfortable with things like saddling and taking the bridle and taking a new rider. I don't disagree with that necessarily. I think it has a lot to do with the horse that, that you're messing with, with the skill level of the rider and what the goals are for that horse. I will say this though, I found that I can take a lot of the life and a lot of the feel out of my horses by exhausting them over minute details. What I try to do is to get these horses over time confident through repetition and patience with these new lessons. I found that they respond a lot better and that I can preserve a lot of the life and the feel of my colts. Okay. Now, again, I don't want to just grab this latigo and hawk that cinch up in him, you know, and just try to cut him in two. I want to kind of just take it slow and leave it kind of loose on him, okay? I mean, that's, that's snug. It's snug enough that if he lost his mind right here, 
the saddle wouldn't fall off, but it's not quite as snug as it's going to be when I go to step up on him. All right, pull that hind cinch to where it's making contact, okay? You don't, still don't want to cut them in two with it, but make sure that it makes contact. All right. The great thing about this program and what I hope to be able to show in this, in this series of videos is that we raise horses in a very sort of old school natural way, okay? Our horses live outside for the most part. You can see that giant barn back there. We've got 52 stalls and it's all modern and, and state of the art, but but our philosophy is that horses just get along better living outside in a herd, okay? Um, and they do. Now, we'll have some of the most modern performance horse bloodlines that you can, that you can find out there. Uh, there's one by the Boone, which is owned by the, by, uh, the King Ranch. She's a really nice filly. And then standing out there, we got metallic cats and highbrow cats and, you know, and, and once in a blue Boons and a little bit of everything. But, um, but we still, they're still horses at the end of the day, okay? Uh, just because they come from really accomplished performance horse stallions and mares doesn't mean that we're going to treat them any different from any of the other horses, okay? This is a ranch. This is primarily a cow-calf operation. And all of our horses have to sort of, you know, they have to live in that environment. We're not a show horse barn. Um, I'm really proud of that fact. I love the fact that we're kind of a punchy old outfit and we still sort of do things the old way. I think we incorporate the best of modern philosophy and practices, but at the same time, we keep things sort of old when it comes to the uh, traditions, okay? And, the, and the, our attitudes toward livestock are that uh, they're livestock and that they're in our care and we're stockmen and our job is to take the best possible care of them that we can. A big part of that is, like I said, leaving these horses outside to grow up. Now this horse right here is, is uh, he's sired by a stallion that we, that we leave turned out in the pasture with mares named Smart Revolution. Smart Revolution is by a horse named Dual Pet. I'm sorry, by Dual Ray, and out of a mare named the Smart Look, and the Smart Look is a pretty accomplished mare. Um, so he's just a, a jam up stallion for us. And then this colt's mama was just sort of a, well, she was Tanqueray and Wheel and Peppy bred. So she's sort of old school, like 1970s uh, and 80s uh, kind of cutting and performance horse stock. So uh, he's sort of a cross of old and new. I really like this colt a lot, and he's one, I guess, you know, compared to some of his, some of the ones that he runs with in the pasture out there, he's not bred quite as good, say, as, you know, the Boone Two Soons or the Metallic Cats, but, but I still think that he's got just as much of a shot uh, out there in the performance horse world as some of those, those uh, better bred, better bred prospects, you know, so. Now, I understand that those are sort of old-fashioned ideas when it comes to raising and training horses, but the simple fact of the matter is that when we let them live outside and let a horse be a horse, they just have a much better quality of life. I feel like it makes us better horsemen too. Boy, that filly sure is a blessing to see. She's sired by a horse named Jess's Topaz, and we've wanted one ever since we saw him out at the Four Sixes a few years ago. I'm certain that this filly's got a, an exceptionally bright future, but I'm afraid that she's having a rocky start. Now that's Nicole Daphne right there taking care of that foal. Can't tell you how relieved I am to have her here to make sure that that filly gets a good start.
Well, this filly's just having a hard time getting latched on. Sometimes we have to give them a little assistance in finding the spout, you know. And it could be that we have to get them some professional medical assistance, but whatever it takes, we're gonna give her a good shot at life. But let me show you how I mount with this, with this snaffle bit, with this single rein, okay? So when it's a single rein situation like this one, and I use this a lot, okay, and you'll find out why. Uh, basically, it's because it's just real functional, real easy to use uh, on these real young horses. But, but what you want to do is you want to put a loop, okay, in your rein just like that, okay, with this side quite a bit shorter than the other. All right, and so basically what that looks like is you just grab it and throw your loop in it just like that. All right. And then you're going to mount just the same way as if this horse had never been mounted before. Okay. Now this colt, I can already tell he's got a little feel in this snaffle bit. You know, he's feeling pretty, pretty good, but he, he's not gonna be one of these ones that immediately just wants to flex his neck, you know, and come around. He's uh, dual ray bred on the top. And so, you know, if y'all ridden a lot of these dual rays, you know that they can be, you know, they can be a little funny about their shoulders and about their face. Um, they can be a little stingy. So when I get up here, what I want to do is just sticking to our five principles. We're basically starting over again in those five principles. It's the, it's, we want to start quiet and quiet, right? So I just get up here and, uh, I make sure that I don't, you know, the last thing I want to do is get up here and drive both of my spurs into his sides and scream hi ya. You know, that's not going to be productive. I want to get up here and, just walk him around nice and quiet. Maybe give him some subtle cues as, as far as direction goes. Um, just sort of get him relaxed, carry my weight around. Make sure he's not gonna try to buck me off. I get a lot of feel, you know, on, on whether or not they're gonna uh, try anything silly as far as how they, is how they're, they're, what their posture is when I get up here. You know, a lot of horses, if they just, if I get up here and they brace and they've got a big hump in their back and I can, you know, it's a lot of watermelon under the saddle back there, then I know that, huh, maybe I ought to get off and do a little more groundwork. Uh, if I get up here and they're nice, soft, and relaxed like this cold is, then I feel like it's gonna go pretty good, so. And it's, it doesn't take a, it doesn't take a, um, a super great horseman to feel that. Now, when I first got started in this business, I didn't have the feel or the foresight to try to keep a horse from bucking me off when I first climbed up in the saddle. The truth is, I liked the idea of a bucking horse when I was young. It was part of the allure that drew me to the idea of being a colt man. But as I've gotten older, I found that uh, it's quite a bit more satisfying to try to set a horse up for success so that they don't try to buck me off. I like to think that I can still handle the salty ones, but at the end of the day, I know that a fella's only got so many bucking horse rides left in him. All right, so we'll just pick up the pace a little bit. Let's post at this trot. Okay, you can see he's kinda, kinda going all over the place. His head's kinda up and down. He wants to go towards the gate. He wants to shy at the camera and then fade out at the gate. Oh, that's okay. Just ignore all that stuff. Just ride your horse. See if we can get a left lead and a lope out of him. Nope. Just blew that. Try it again. There we go. Just stay up here and guide your horse, okay? I try to do less circles and more diagonals that are more, uh, more of an octagon shape. Woo. You know, when I'm doing this, these deals, I try to go in straight lines and then sort of change direction. Okay. So you see, he's kind of ducking off here, going to the right. 
what I'm going to do right there is I'm going to stop him. I'm going to bring him back out to the fence and we're going to start over. Okay. He wants to duck off right there. I'll bring him back out here. We'll start over. And all of this is really good. For just teaching him, you know, what direction to go. So I gotta bring him back out here. There we go. That's a little bit better. A little bit better. There's very little behavior right now that he, you know, it's very, very few things that he's going to do right now that are going to cause me to get emotional, get mad, and uh, really start hammering on him, okay? He just doesn't know anything. So the important thing is just to be patient and wait for, wait for things to happen, you know? Set it up, teach him the lessons nice and slow and soft. He's going to get frustrated. He might do some things that you don't like, like throwing his head around and and uh, cutting the pin off and all that. But you see now, he's wanting to stay out there a little bit closer. That's really good. So just can, and this is, this is my resistance, okay? This is, this is um, principle three of the five principles for effective horsemanship is find the resistance, right? So this is the resistance right here is for him to stay on the outside of the pin going off to the right. Okay, what he wants to do is watch his left side and just drop that right shoulder and duck off to the inside of the pin. Okay. Now there's a handy little tip for you folks that have horses that want to drop their shoulder when you're loping circles or cut the pin off when you're working them in the round pin. Just bring them back and start them over. So I'm just going to wind this guy down. I mean, I think that's just an outstanding ride. All right, we conquered a little bit of resistance there. Going to compromise. It wasn't, the, wasn't perfect. Doesn't have to be. It'll be a little bit better tomorrow, a little bit better the next day and so on until all that resistance goes away okay going to just drop back to remember your first principle is start quiet in quiet okay always make sure that you drop back to something that they're comfortable doing okay and walking these nice soft circles is something that he's pretty comfortable doing so look at that head coming down i mean that's just outstanding stuff right there now our goal with Low Country Cowboys is to try to preserve a piece of American life that we feel is rapidly disappearing. It's also to give folks a glimpse into what it's like to live with horses and cattle. If you'd like to see a little bit more, we encourage you to go to www.b1horsemanship.com. There you can see all of the daily training segments that we have and, and tons of instructional videos on, on starting colts and getting horses going in the snaffle bit, working cattle, roping and ranching. Also go to www.creekplantation.com. There you can see a lot of the horses that we have for sale. You can see some photos of the ranch, some of the people that work here and that sort of thing. Again, that's www.b1horsemanship.com or www.creekplantation.com. Thanks again for watching.